As you all on the webinar may well know, the South is rich with abundant, sustainable supplies of forest materials. These forest materials commonly serve as feedstocks for lumber and building materials, home furnishings, paper products, and other goods. But there's a growing demand for wood-based feedstocks for conversion of biofuels, biopower, thermal applications, solid fuels, and other, other bio-based products. Our methods for harvesting and transporting wood has changed little, little over the past few decades, and the intended end use of wood seems to do little to impact or influence these practices. However, infill drying offers the opportunity for woody biomass energy to increase in supply and decrease in cost. Most of us are familiar with the need to carefully dry wood under controlled conditions to extract the maximum performance, quality, and value from lumber and building materials. Prop drying also protects against decay, fungal stains, and insect pests, thus adding value to raw timber. But what considerations are given to the drying of wood if the finished product will not be valued for aesthetics, strength, or machining, but rather valued for the amount of BTUs that can be derived per unit volume? As we know, dry wood is lighter, thus the transportation and handling costs are reduced, and less energy is used in the pre-processing of the wood materials. For the bioenergy value chain to grow and be competitive, we must reevaluate how feedstock materials are handled from harvest to facility gate. Uh, landowners, loggers, bioenergy producers all stand to benefit from natural drying processes. NCSU has worked to document the drying schedules of logging residues, the time and energy used in microtripping green and dry logging residues, and scanning moisture content at the truck dump. By participating in this webinar, you'll develop a better understanding of how infill drying lowers energy costs, increases supply of energy, and decreases the costs associated with material that requires additional drying. Later today on this webinar, you'll also hear from a representative, Mr. Rich Harley, of Process Sensor, Sensor Corporation on the use of near-infrared transmitters and in their involvement in this infield drying research. To help us better understand the benefits of infield drying, Chris Hopkins will discuss his work in developing infield wood drying techniques and testing procedures and measurement. Mr. Hopkins is a doctoral candidate in forestry economics, is in a research and associate in forest biomaterials at NCSU. He is the founding member and lead developer of the Torfication Development Project, and he is developing biochar production technologies and investigating their effect on soil productivity. Mr. Hopkins, if you can, uh, I guess, unmute and join on, I'm going to turn the controls over to you, and I appreciate your participation in today's webinar. All right. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Okay, yeah, yeah. good. All right. So, um, well, let's, let's let's get started. Um, I don't have control just yet. All right. There we go. All right. So, infield drying of woody biomass fuels. Um, this is a NC State project um, that we hope can transform forest economies with a value-added fuel. Um, I guess the, the first thing I should try to do is to is to frame where this um, infield drying fits and why it might be appropriate for going from buckets to barrels in scale. Um, what we're what we're doing here isn't something that uh, creates a new fuel. It's not another ethanol. It's you know it's still wood, um, and it's not a not a diesel, and it's not you know some new fancy new way of doing things. Um, and it doesn't grow trees any faster either. What it does is it maximizes the energy that we get out of the trees that we already grow, and tries to make them change them enough that they're a um, more energetic and more valuable uh, feedstock into subsequent processes. So, and with that, we'll just get started. Um, so we've we've had a lot of partners um, as we've moved forward doing infield drying. Um, NC State is where I work. Uh, the Biofuel Center of North Carolina was a recent funder of us before they, um, their existence was ended by our state legislature. Um, currently, the funding that was coming through the Biofuel Center is now coming through North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Um, 
some of the initial funding for this was through the U.S. Endowment for Forests and Communities. They, they funded the first three years of our operations. Carolina Commonwealth has been a consistent partner on the logging side. They're our go-to partner for getting feedstock, getting wood chips. They've been extremely flexible and extremely generous in helping us out. Uh, the North Carolina Professional Association of Professional Loggers has likewise been instrumental in, in making sure that all of our field operations happen and getting the word out to their members about what we were doing, how we were doing it, and the successes we were having. Um, Walkie is a Swedish um, paper tarp company. We've used their tarps in covering um, wood in the field, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Maxiload Scales. Uh, of course, provided scales, and Peterson Corporation was in charge of helping us with chipping. Um, they've provided microchippers for a lot of our operations. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So the fundamental relationship that we are working with with infield drying is the relationship of you know the higher the moisture content of wood, the lower the available energy the lower heating value of wood is. Um, higher heating value of wood doesn't change. Higher heating value is the heating value of wood um, when it's perfectly dry. The lower heating value um, is the heating value of wood, including that moisture. Most wood in the field is about 50% moisture content, and so it's somewhere around 4,000 uh, BTUs per pound of energy. 4,000 BTUs of energy per pound of wood. Um, as it dries out, you know that um, a pound of wood will have a much higher BTU content, all the way up to about 8,500 BTUs per pound. Um, the the one thing to keep in mind is that as wood dries out, a given volume of wood. You know, as it's drying out, um, it's it's losing weight. So, on net, you know, as we go from about 50 to say 20 percent moisture content, that wood will lose about three eighths of its original weight. Next slide. So, there's a lot of energy conversion technologies that exist out there in the world. Um, I've worked on a, on a number of them, you know, whether that's wood pellets, making wood pellets, torrified wood. I do some work with charcoal as well. But one of the, one of the consistent things that no matter what you're, whenever you're changing wood, it seems that there, people always talk about sort of the, the net energy efficiency, you know, and it's usually just like with a battery or a car or a solar panel, you know, it's always, you know, how much, what percentage of the available energy did you, did you, um, were you able to capture? Um, rarely do you hear about, well, you know, how much more energy did you get by doing this process? Well, that's one of the neat things about infield drying is actually you end up with more energy after you're done than you started with. Way, one way I've, I've tried to explain this and, um, to a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks when I've made this presentation is, you know, you look at the ratio or you look at the um, size of these bars. These bars are the input cost per million BTUs of input and input cost per million BTUs of output. Um, for wood pellets, for torrified wood, for charcoal, in each case, the right-hand bar, the yellow bar, is taller than the left-hand bar. What that tells you is that um, there was a, you know, the cost per BTU go up as you do this energy conversion. Now, in many cases, there's a good, very good reason for doing that. You know, wood pellets, you are making something that is a flowable, easily transportable, relatively dense product, likewise for torrefaction, you know, um, same reason generally was always true for charcoal. You know, you're, you make a more energy dense product and in, in what you give up is some of the original 
energy to do that. In Greenwood, on the left-hand side, you see that you know both the input and the output costs are the same because we haven't done anything to it. Now, what's different about chips from air-dried wood? You know, 20 percent meaning 20 percent moisture content. Um, what's different is that the input cost per million BTUs of output cost goes down. It's the one. It's the one instance of all the cases I have up there where the cost goes down as you do the drying. And we'll explain a little bit about why that is if it's not immediately or intuitively obvious. Uh, potential of infield drying from 50% to 20% moisture content. So as you dry out wood, um, and wood will just dry out, you know, it, it like it does uh, when you're stacking firewood. The reason people cut their firewood green and then stack it up, let it dry out, is you end up with more energy and you end up with a better product for, for burning. It's not as smoky, catches fire easier, um, just lots of lots of good reasons, doesn't make as much creosote. But uh, one of the main reasons is you actually end up with more energy. So um, along those lines, you can lower your energy delivery costs by about almost 50% per unit of energy. That's a that's a important fact to keep in mind. Essentially what you're doing is you're able to put twice as many BTUs on a, in a given chip van if you're chipping up dried wood. Uh, you can increase the supply of energy from the forest resources around you by about 25%, somewhere between 25 and 33% um, increase in the total energy from your forest resources. You also can decrease the cost of drying prior to pelletization by a very, very large degree, about 75%. So those are some of the potential benefits. And the nice thing about wood drying is that everybody should be able to share in the value chain. All the, all the essential elements in the value chain can share. Landowners, um, essentially they're gonna be increasing the energy production on their land by that same proportion. So they don't make a whole heck of a lot of money right now on energy wood. Maybe they get paid a dollar per green ton. So conceivably at least you could reward landowners by in proportion to the amount of increased value that's coming off of their land. So maybe they get a little bit of a pay raise for their wood. The wood goes from a dollar to a buck twenty five or a buck thirty five per ton delivered. Loggers, on the other hand, transportation is a huge component of their costs for delivering wood energy to a power plant or to a to a pellet plant. Transportation is typically half the total cost, so the total savings could be as much as 25% per unit of energy uh, wood energy delivered. Power producers uh, they stand to gain by having a de decreased sourcing radius um, and also a uptick in their boiler efficiency because they're not moving as much water vapor through their boilers they end up with a much higher efficiency um, basically you've got hotter less hotter gases as opposed to more less hot gases in the in the water in the case of wood with water vapor um, embodied along with it. So it's a, it's a good way for power producers to end up with a much more efficient plant. Next. All right, so the reason we think this is feasible and something that might be achievable in the southeast of the US is that it's already done in Scandinavia. It's not exactly the same situations we have in North Carolina, but um, I might take a minute to describe how it's done in Scandinavia. Typically, they do their harvesting um, during the spring, summer, early fall. Typically, they're doing stroke delimbing out in the field, and so they have lots of piles of logs, lots of piles of slash. Um, those piles are left to dry 
not the logs, the slash is left to dry for a month, two months, three months, and then it's collected, brought to the roadside, piled, and covered with a paper tarp. You can see the paper tarp in this picture here on the left-hand side, and then the paper tarp has a little bit of log slash thrown on top of it, and away you go. That essentially protects the biomass that is already dried from getting re-wetted. And probably most importantly, it helps keep the snow off of the biomass. So if they come back in the middle of the winter they, um, to pick up this material, it's not one giant icy mess. They can actually get to individual sticks and they burn these, um, they have the ability to burn uh, woody biomass like this in, in large, large form. So it's important that it's not caked with ice. Now, that's not to say that that'll be the way we do it in North Carolina. Um, there's some significant differences in how we harvest trees, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So NC State's uh, CHIP study, that again, this was our infield drying study. This was started with money from the U.S. Endowment for Forests and Communities. So we promised to look at several different aspects of of uh, infield drying. Infield drying schedules, just how fast does the material dry? Looking at the how difficult it is to do chipping of dried wood, and then looking into moisture sensing at the point of sale. And then the last one is what we're doing with uh, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture funding. We're going to be looking at forest operations and how to how to optimize your forest operations to accommodate infield drying. All right, so drying schedules. We did our drying analysis and developed our schedules based on wood sitting on trailers. It was thought in Joe Royce, who is one of the professors that supervised this work, he had done some um, he had done some work looking at the drying of pulpwood on trailers as a way of quantifying losses of pulpwood. People were they could never get their accounting right at um, at chip mills, at satellite chip mills, or at uh, paper factories because the wood was drying out. So they needed to account for the wood drying out over time. And you know, they saw very significant decreases in weight over time. And drier wood is also wood that is harder to harder to pulp. So we looked at um wood drying on trailers as a as a operational convenience as a way of achieving the study and measuring the drying rates of wood. Um, they, the other thing that Royce had discovered was that wood drying on trailers dries at about the same rate as wood drying in very big stacks. So that having the wood drying in a, in a stack or on a trailer really doesn't matter once you get to a certain scale. Um, large piles of wood all dry at about the same rate was his insight. So we felt pretty comfortable drying wood on trailers and saying that that would be a, a reasonable approximation of how wood would dry in a large pile out in the field. So we looked at wood drying on trailers. We looked at hardwood and pine, mixed hardwoods and pine. We looked at tops versus tops and the first stick of pulpwood. We um, and we also looked at covered with paper tarp versus not covered with paper tarp. Before, <clears throat> excuse me. Before we get too far down the road, um, the paper tarps did not really add or take away anything from this drying rate study. Um, for a variety of reasons, they don't seem to work have worked nearly as well in our case as they do in Scandinavia. Part of the problem may be that we put them lengthways down the pot, down the um, wood, or down the uh, length of the trailer. Putting it lengthways down the trailer allows a lot of pockets and valleys to form, and they 
those pockets and valleys, the, the paper tarp itself held the water, kept the, kept the water, um, seemed to be pretty water repellent, but it didn't necessarily offer a place for the water to roll off the trailer. So for for those reasons, it may have been our poor implementation, but the, the paper tarps really had zero effect on how fast stuff dried. In addition, it was a little bit of a challenge getting the paper tarps up on top of the wood pile and also securing those paper tarps. So. But nonetheless, um, we had three full um, sessions, if you will, of drying wood on trailers. Um, this is just a, an example of drying wood on trailers in 2011. So we have all eight treatments laid out and followed over time. One thing you'll notice is that there's a little wiggles in the uh, drying up on the top. And we think that's spring rains, essentially. As it rained um, from one week to the next, you'd see little gains and losses in weight. But remarkably steady drying all throughout the summer, except for the very end, where we had a little pop-up. And we think that was just a single rain event. So. But overall, the pattern is a, a pretty rapid decrease in moisture content over what appears to be about five, six months. So we repeated this throughout the year, keeping track of temperature, um, average daily temperature, average daily humidity, daily precipitation, um, and able to, we're able to make a differential um, model that accounted for changes in date. Uh, an exponential model that accounted for you know, the amount of time and the weather conditions throughout that time and estimated a model had very tight um, overall fit about a 96 percent r squared and very high significance of most of our parameters especially temperature and humidity uh, but also precipitation where we um where this is all going is we're able to, given average North Carolina climate, we can make predictions about how fast things will dry. So, and that's laid out here in this graph here. Um, so the, you'll notice the change in color from a dark green to a much lighter green color. And what you see is that, you know, the month of initiation, the vertical axis, you know, we can uh, we can incorporate the month of initiation and follow it all throughout the year. We do that for all the different, um, oh, throughout a, a full annual cycle. So regardless of when you start, whether it's January or December, you're essentially exposed to the full breadth of relative humidity and temperature throughout that year and eventually we end up at about the same degree of drying so you can go from 50 percent down to about 10 percent moisture in more or less 330 360 days if you need a lower degree of drying say uh oh i don't know somewhere between 20 and 30 percent on that border it makes a big big difference what month you start in it makes a big difference whether you start in um, say July which ironically gives you the longest time to get to dry or March the reason it takes a long time to to get to your sufficient level of drying in July is that you're essentially at starting at the end of the summer and now you're facing a relatively cool and long fall and it'll take you just about till the next spring to get down to dry whereas if you start in March what you're facing is six months of the driest weather driest and hottest weather so depending on the degree of drying that you need uh, will affect your planning and your thought thinking on when to start drying. Next. 
So we also did a bunch of chipping tests. We consistently used the Peterson 4300 drum chipper. It's a 12 pocket drum chipper with a water injection system. The water injection system is something that Peterson developed as a way of compensating for the lack of water in dry wood. They're able to chip dry wood with this water injection system. It puts in about a gallon to two gallons per minute. That translates, given the productivity of these kinds of chippers, that, which is about 50, 60 tons per hour, it's about a gallon or two of water per ton of wood produced. That gallon or two of water really hardly bumps at all the moisture content of that wood. The, the water is used to keep the blades cool. So the blades pass over the wood, they heat up just a little bit, and as they come back around, they, they're given a little shot of a little mist of water that cools them down and they are ready to go at the wood again. Without the water, the blades tend to heat up and lose their temper and they, hence they dull a little bit faster. But uh, when you have the water injection system, you can chip it um, just about full pace and no problems with blades heating up. Consequently, you have the same sort of blade duration or blade um, longevity as you would with any other chipping green wood. So um, the, the, we measured fuel consumption, time to chip, productivity of chipping by weighing the vans before and after each load of chips went through, took into account the moisture content, and the general relationship is lower moisture content um, increases throughput on a million BTUs of output per hour and decreases the number of tons per gallon, but doesn't overall affect the fuel efficiency significantly. Um, we actually saw a slight increase, about 25% increase in fuel efficiency. Unfortunately, there was so much variability around that figure that it was hard to distinguish it from um, no, you know, there was a, wasn't any significant difference, any significant change in the overall fuel efficiency. So. Um, the, the take home message from the dry chipping test is that uh, you can do you can chip dry material without any real negative consequence. Next. So the current woody biomass market in the southeast, uh, I'm told this is changing a little bit, but the, the general, I think it's still a fair statement to say that the general way that people buy wood for energy in the southeast is still based on weight rather than on energy. So people who are loggers who are delivering wood have a perverse incentive to deliver the lowest value material. Um, Frequently, you hear about people parking their log trucks under the eaves of a barn if they think it's going to rain overnight, and you know, delivering instead of you know, the typical log truck will have about be about two thirds full, or the typical chip van will be about two thirds full and weigh 25 tons. So they'll show up with a typical wood chip van and it'll weigh 30 or 35 tons, and they get paid the same rate whether it's uh, they're delivering wet wood or dry wood. They get, you know, so the chip, uh, the the energy producer has just paid um, for a bunch of water that is going to do them absolutely no good. So if there were a fair way to reward drying activity, drying activities at the point of purchase, that would go a long way to resolving the this perverse incentive to deliver water. To people who don't need it. Next. Hey, Chris. This yes. Helene, uh, um, you've been listing a lot of uh, million BTUs throughout the presentation. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could provide the audience maybe with um, 
the, B, the average BGU value for maybe um, pine and then average BGU value for hardwood, and maybe how that's different, um, you know, say if you have something that's, I guess, you know, extremely wet wood or dry wood, if you can okay. kind of gauge that a little bit. So probably the high, one of the highest value, highest energy value um, species we have are pine. Um, the downside of pine from an energy point of view often is that it has a lot of sap, a lot of pitch in it, and that tends to be tends to be sticky and um, isn't necessarily the most con most conducive to burning. Other than you know, and it's a it's a small difference. It's a difference of about 400 BTUs per pound. So pine may be as high as 8,800. Some of the less dense hardwoods, you know, may have an energy value of maybe 8,400 BTUs per pound, 8,300 BTUs per pound. Um, when they're wet, you know, the um, the relative benefit of pine versus hardwood seems to seems to vanish. They they both go down into the low 4,000s, maybe maybe the high 3,000s or energy content per pound depending on um depending on just how wet they are. Wet wood chips can, you know, if you've got a pile of wood chips that has been freshly soaked by the rain can easily be 55 almost 60% moisture content. Typically, you know, freshly harvested wood chips that are, you know, put through the the chipper in the morning and arrive at the say an energy plant in that afternoon will have a moisture content somewhere between 45 and 50 percent. If they're allowed to dry for just a couple, three weeks, you know, it may drop to 40 and it'll slowly keep drying. You know, let's say it's good, favorable weather, nice dry spring, you know, they'll lose weight consistently um, and get down into the 20 Twenty percent range, probably within three to four months. Um, we've measured some some trailers of chips that were as low as fifteen, sixteen percent after I think five or six months. Um, so the critical value for maximizing the amount of energy on a chip fan, <laughs> excuse me, is about twenty percent moisture content. At that. Okay. At that energy content, you've got um, you've maxed out the volume of a chip van and have and still have you know all the weight on there. If you get drier than about twenty two and twenty two percent moisture content, you can keep your chip van completely full, but it doesn't miss, you know, it, and it'll have more and more energy on it, but you don't get a, a market increase in the um, energy content for that for that chip van. You there's a essentially a dog leg or a kink in the um, in the relationship between total energy on a on a van and um, and uh, moisture content, and that turns and gets a lot less steep. That relationship between total energy and Moisture content um, gets a lot less steep right around the 22% mark. All right. So, Chris, so let's, if you let's, compared that to coal, so you're comparing the 22% to coal, what would the BTU value of coal be? Is that like 14,000? Coal, coal is around, um, typically coal is around 12,000 BTUs per pound, good bituminous coal okay. on a lower heating value scale. So. Okay. Coal is, is of course, yeah, coal is a much more energy dense um product. It uh it pulverizes all the way down to a powder and the way people burn coal is um is as a powder. They burn it as an aerosol. Um they move they move the coal around the plant as an aerosol. But um and that's actually one of the reasons we pursued the torrefaction technology. It's it's a way of turning Turning wood into a product that can be pulverized a lot like coal can and be burned in that same aerosolized form. But uh, going back to a way of rewarding drying activity, well, um, if you could measure the moisture content 
at the point of sale as the truck is being lifted up and all the wood chips are dumping out into a bin or a hopper, um, that would be the ideal way of measuring measuring moisture content and being able to, to reward people on delivered energy rather than on weight. So we found the co several companies that thought they might be able to deliver on this, uh, on the promise of real-time measurement of moisture content. Moistech was one of them, process sensors, who you'll hear from a little bit later on today, and Malcam were able to ship us um, sensors that we could test uh, in the lab. Um, again, Malcam process sensors and Moistech. And we had, this is a picture of the truck dump at Craven County Wood Energy, and that's where they lift up the truck um, and the trailer and open up the back gate and boom, all the chips fall into that bin. They're conveyed over to the plant, or actually to a pile and then to the plant. We originally thought that the best place to put a moisture sensor would be on that back bumper. Uh, Rich and process sensors talked us out of that, <laughs> out of that uh, idea. We put the, the sensor in a much smarter place um, on a belt just after the uh, just after that truck dump. So we'll and Rich will talk about just how the sensors work. One thing we added to the science, if you will, of moisture sensing was that we noticed there was a very strong um, change in slope. Uh, the reflectance ratio changed as you went from drier to much wetter material. And the way that moist tech and process sensors um, dealt with this in the past is they'd have a, a band of light um, a wavelength of light that they like to use for wet stuff and another wavelength that they like to use for dry stuff. What we realized is that for both of them, what they were the reason there was this difference between wet stuff and dry stuff is I think the wood you were actually looking at the um, fiber saturation point of the wood at at about thirty percent um, moisture content, the wood is fully soaked, all the vessels, all the internal structure of the wood is completely filled up with water, and now you have wa water actually hanging on and around and between wood chips on the surface. And I think that's what's going on, at, and you have that sort of kink in the um, relationship. So being aware of that, that relationship um, and the change in reflectance is important and you can accommodate that that change in reflectance by having a segmented linear regression that, it, that can account for that change in reflectance. Essentially, you have to estimate one more parameter when you're doing your linear regressions, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward operation and relatively easy to program into, into a system of wood moisture measurement. Next. So we've done some pelleting and combustion tests of dried wood. In Viva Biomass was was interested in working with us right from the get-go. They participated in two of our uh, wood chipping trials. And they changed the design of one of their plants to accommodate a much larger um, wood yard and wood stocking so they could take advantage of drying. Now it's not in field drying, it's at the plant drying, but they leave lots of wood stocked up. I think they have a three or four month buffer of wood and they're documenting the drying rates of that wood that's been stocked up. Um, UNC Chapel Hill, they did a dry microchip flow test uh, successfully in the fall of 2012. Unfortunately, the um, we haven't been able to get back to do a full scale drying test or um, combustion test of dried wood at their plant since. Um, but we're hoping that with some other technologies that we're developing at State that we may be able to get back there and do a full-scale 
um, drying test sometime in the near future. So uh, moving on to the work that we're going to be doing this spring, summer, and fall, the study on the trailers was to document drying in a rigorous manner to be able to come back and weigh those trailers every two weeks and say, yep, the wood's drying, you know, and this is how important humidity and temperature are to the drying process. The new work we're planning on doing in um, the western part of the state, essentially the Piedmont and the and the mountains of, of North Carolina, we're going to be documenting drying and stacking techs, techniques, cost and feasibility. And the idea is to come up with ways of stacking that are as efficient with as little extra equipment, time, and effort as possible. We, what we want to do is get to the point of operationalizing this infield drying. We've shown the benefits from it. We've shown that it can be done. What remains is to show how much it might actually cost to implement on the ground and whether it's feasible or not. So we did a little bit of practicing with this last spring. We were taking, this was the uh, North Carolina professional loggers help organize a logging technologies class through a couple of the community colleges on the eastern part of the state. They're running one this year as well. And the idea is it gives students a oppor first-hand opportunity to use relatively large equipment and get into the business of, of being a logger, to be trained properly in, in being a logger. So we took advantage of them learning how to do uh, logging to build some waste wood piles. So we wanted to try to build a pile that was um, relatively high, had little ground contact, and would get aerated well and not need any specialized equipment. What you have there is your typical grapple skitter using a lip on the back of the, of the grapple skitter to elevate the trees so that they can be piled well. So we built a couple of small piles, um, and there's no reason to think that we couldn't take that same pile and continue to stretch out as far as we'd like. That represents maybe two loads of of wood. And so what we came up with that seems to work well is sort of this butts out orientation. So the, the big meaty end of the stem, each um, each grapple load was pointed out about a 30 degrees from the general orientation of the pile, or as much as 30 degrees from the general orientation of the pile. But the top, the, the lighter stuff, we attempted to get pretty much down the middle of the pile. This is sort of the butts out configuration. And what you see, what you'll see is that very few of these trees are actually in contact with the ground. Maybe you know one in ten of these stems is in, actually in contact with the ground at any point. If we can do that and, and maintain that, that will essentially simulate trailer drying. There should, and in fact, maybe even better than trailer drying, just because the things aren't packed in as tight as they are on a trailer. Quite often on the trailers, people were trying to, the loggers we were working with were trying to get as much weight as possible on the trailer to make it quote unquote worthwhile. So they put the logs on there and interleave them. You know, one, one log would be going, you know, would have the butt towards the end of the trailer and the next log would have the butt towards the front of the trailer. And they were trying to maximize the amount of wood on the trailer, but uh, it ended up making the trailers a little bit on the dense side. And they, perhaps didn't dry out as fast as they might. This way, though, I th think you'll have lots of airflow through those piles, and they should dry out pretty quickly. The other nice thing is that if you put them down in, you can sort of see where each grapple load of wood uh, came from. You know, you can still identify the grapple loads of wood. If you can identify them now, hopefully you can come back and pick them up in the same same way you put them down. Next. So we're 
just getting ramped up now for um, our spring effort. We're looking for two private forest landowners who could harvest um, in the spring into the early summer. We're looking for hardwood stands, and we're just going to have a – we'll need to have about 200 tons of low-value hardwood on each property um, in two piles. One pile will be used for documenting the drying down. So we'll go in and destructively sample those piles over time to document the dry down rate, see if there's any differences in position within the pile um, or differences from uh, from diameter or uh, location on the tree, whether it was near the top or near the bottom. And also, um, then the other pile will be used for a microchipping study just to document yet yet again that the microchipping is feasible on the on these pot infield piles. And that's about um that's about it for this part of the presentation. Rich, do you want to take over? I'm actually Brent's going to introduce Rich um okay. Chris. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Appreciate it there, Chris. I appreciate your participation and, and talking about the work that you're doing um, on infield drying. <clears throat> As Helene mentioned earlier, we're going to be uh, taking questions and presenting them to the and providing the presenters at the end of both presentations. I already see one up there to, to everyone and look forward to hearing an answer on that. Uh, but if everybody could stick around and hold on to your questions, we'll move on to our next presenter, who is Mr. Rich Harley. Um, as you know, measuring, and as you heard, measuring feedstock characteristics such as moisture is important for end users to ensure that wood processes run smoothly, efficiently, and deliver a consistent final product, whether, that wood, whether that's wood pellets, a liquid fuel, or electricity. And joining us today to discuss the benefits of having accurate moisture measurements and the tools that are utilized to collect this info is Mr. Rich Harley. Rich is the Corporate Sales Manager, Regional Sales Manager for the Southeast for Process Sensors Corporation, and he is located in Raleigh, North Carolina. He has been with the company since 2006, and his territory includes North Carolina, South Carolina, as well. You'll see the states there on, on, the, um, on the webinar presentation. But Rich, I want to turn it over to you, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Brent, and thank you, Helene. I uh, hope everybody's having a good afternoon. I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your Friday afternoon to, to listen to uh, what Chris had to say. I'm going to give you guys a short presentation on process sensors, uh, basically what we do, uh, kind of what we do with the with the wood, woody biomass and biofuel industry, uh, you know, why, why you would use NIR, give you a short explanation of what uh, near-infrared technology means. Um, show you a couple of products and then answer any questions you guys may have. So we'll get started. So quick history of Process Sensors Corporation. Uh, we are a privately owned company. We are based out of uh, Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, everything is USA made. Uh, everything is made up there at the manufacturing facility. Company was formed in 1996. We also have offices in the UK, Poland, and Malaysia. Uh, there are about I would say 50, 55 employees worldwide. Uh, several of us, such as myself, uh, work out of our houses and cover territories uh, ranging anywhere from South America to North America um, on this side of the world. And then on the other side of the world, we do deal with some reps, but most of our sales are direct uh, on this side of the world. Let's talk a little bit about near infrared. Uh, Chris kind of got into uh, some in-depth uh, science uh, behind near infrared. I'm going to give you a kind of a, a very basic uh, way of way near infrared technology works. Uh, so this kind of gives you a, a very brief and basic design of how our sensors are, are designed. Basically, near infrared works off of the reflectance and or absorbance principle. So it is light. Uh, we do have a halogen lamp that is producing just uh, normal visible light. There's a filter wheel inside of our sensors that's spinning at about 2,000 RPM. And on that filter wheel, we have different filters that refract the light into different wavelengths of near-infrared light. Uh, Chris kind of got into it and touched on it a little bit, but 
basically different bonds uh, in the material, you know, in a solid material, respond to different wavelengths of near infrared light. Uh, you know, uh, if you're looking for moisture, obviously it's an OH bond. We can also measure oils and fats, which are CH bonds. And then we can also measure the amine group, which uh, leads more towards uh, protein. Basically, that beam is, is split into two different beams. Uh, you have an internal reference beam, and then you have an external beam. And what happens is, as the beam hits the, the solid material, such as wood chips or, or you know, uh, sawdust, anything like that, uh, part of that light is absorbed by the OH bonds inside the material. Whatever is not absorbed is then reflected back up into the sensor itself, and then using algorithms, uh, several other calculations inside of the head. I won't go into that science right now, it, it'll bore you, but it basically converts it into a percent moisture uh, that we can give you. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, outputs and uh, what we can offer with, the, with that reading later on. Why use near infrared? So we're in several different industries, but the, the main thing for a lot of these guys is quality control. So, you, you know, uh, especially in a lot of the wood products. So let's take wood pellets, for example. You know, they want to know their final product moisture. That's a big thing for them. They want to have a repeatable and consistent product uh, and maintain specified limits and improve their processing. So it's, it's moisture control over dry use and excessive energy. A lot of these guys, you know, they, they know they want to have their, their dust or their chips at a certain percent moisture. They really don't want to over dry it because it can cause problems later in the process, but they also don't want to under dry it and then their, uh, their pellets don't form properly coming out of the pellet mills. Uh, they do want to produce the product at tighter limits uh, and then reduce scrap, increase speed, increase line efficiency as well industries that use near infrared. So even wood products, and when I say wood products, you know, you're talking about uh, engineered lumber, uh, we do plywood, OSB, MDF, particle board mills, uh, biofuel and biomass. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Tobacco, tobacco is a big one, especially in my territory. So we do deal with uh, tobacco processors, we do deal with cigarette manufacturers, and we deal also with smokeless plants as well. Uh, the snack food industry is a is a fairly large one for us. Uh, you get potato chips, crackers, cookies, uh, extruded snacks, etc. Coffee, minerals and chemicals, uh, paper film conversion, so it's anything uh, corrugated uh, material. Uh, any 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 plant that's that's probably putting a, a wax coating, uh, latex coating, uh, solid base coating, anything like that. It, 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 uh, uh, fits in the paper conversion. And then textiles, of course, uh, non-wovens, carpet. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that industry has moved over uh, overseas. We don't have a lot of that left in the United States. So let's talk about some of the wood fuel and biomass applications that, that our sensors are found in. Uh, as Chris has mentioned, the wood chips, uh, hog fuel, wood pellets, horse bedding, and of course, uh, distiller grains you find coming out of uh, ethanol plants. As far as the wood chips go, uh, let's talk a little bit about the project that Chris and I worked on at Craven. And Chris touched on this a little bit. Basically what we are trying to do is, is get the, give the plant a good idea of what their moisture coming in was. Um, so basically they knew what they're getting out of the, out of the field. And as Chris mentioned, you know, they're dealing with moistures ranging anywhere between, you know, sometimes as low as 20, upwards around 60%, uh, depending on, well, is it fresh wood? Is it wood that's been sitting there? You know, was it, was it wood that had been laying out, uh, drying, uh, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, maybe sitting out in the rain? The uh, thing that Chris was able to find in, in a lot of the testing he did was that it did have a strange strange curve, which we, we don't normally see, but the way the wood chips ran is we actually had to use two different sets of filters in order to produce the results that Chris was looking for. I believe we found some good results with that, and it's kind of an ongoing project for us. The wood pellets is a very big industry for us, and we deal with a lot of people in the U.S., as well as some of the plants over in Europe. 
Uh, if you're familiar with the wood pellet industry down here in the southeast, it is booming. Uh, it's probably one of the largest growing, I would say, biomass and even wood products uh, niches as they're as they're come right now. Uh, we we deal exclusively with in Viva, uh, the, the three plants that they have built uh, in North Carolina, Virginia, all use our sensors. Two of the plants that they bought in Mississippi use our sensors, and then there's another one up in Virginia that they bought that uses one of ours as well. We work with Georgia Biomass, Fram Fuels, Tailfair Forest Products, and then we work with several other smaller companies that are basically domestic producers, such as Barefoot Pellets, uh, Appalachian Wood Pellets up in West Virginia, Maine Wood Pellets, New England Pellets, uh, Pacific Pellets, Pacific Bioenergy. There's several more, um, those on the, uh, the East Coast, and there are some in the Midwest. Uh, horse bedding is another another biomass uh, application we have. And then, like I said, the distiller grains. We do deal with some companies with ethanol. Uh, a couple of companies that I know that we work with, we, we really can't say who they are, but we are in that industry as well. That gives you an idea of who we're, who we're working with and, and some of those pictures kind of show you, you know, where some of our sensors are placed. So for near infrared, a good application is over a moving conveyor. That is the optimum optimum place for us. And that, like I said, uh, when Chris and I were working there at Craven, Chris kind of had an idea of wanting to put the sensor on the bumper of the truck dump. And there were several limitations to that. Uh, there wasn't always a continuous flow. Uh, near infrared doesn't necessarily need a continuous flow, but it is a good, it makes you, it makes a much more uh, smooth process if you have a continuous flow of chips going past the, the unit itself just gives you a much better chance of getting a good reading. Uh, the other issue we saw was that as, as a truck dumps, it's, it's dumping a large mass of wood, and we were concerned that it may knock the sensor and, and possibly knock it into the process or damage it as well. We can look into screw conveyors, which a lot of these pellet manufacturers have. Uh, they're either using a screw conveyor or an open conveyor, but we can look into a screw. You can also look through sight glasses, so if they have a vessel or a hopper where they just don't have a really good spot for us to put a sensor, we can look through a sight glass into the side of a hopper or in the bottom of a screw conveyor as well. Uh, and here's a picture, it's kind of a uh, very simple picture of where you would put a sensor, and, it, and this is for a dryer. I know it's got a uh, water shower inside. but. You can also use these for feedback and feed forward controls. You've got aux, you've got uh, options. You've got analog and digital output, so these can be tied into a PLC. Uh, that's what we're working with Craven to do is to give them a, an output to their to their PLC or their weigh their weighing system, so that the guys know well this load weighs this much and it's that, this percent moisture. Then we know what's coming in. We know what these guys are bringing in for us. Most of the time in pellet mills, uh, the sensors are put normally after the after the dryer, uh, which is normally after the cyclone as well. And then a lot of times they will have the sensor mounted on a belt that's feeding the hammer mills. I'm going to skip this one real quick. So this is our MTC 460WP. Uh, Chris and I work with our uh, last generation, the 360 WP. This is our, our latest generation. It's basically it's a rugged construction for harsh environments. It is, once again, near infrared it is non-contact, non-destructive. It can give you continuous and instantaneous results. They are low maintenance. There's not a whole lot you need to do. Uh, if it is in a wood, a, a harsh wood environment, we do have uh, an air purge that will keep any dust or steam from condensating on the lens. Uh, the, the, I've had these sensors and I've seen them in applications have uh, anywhere between four to six inches of dust on top and they're still running just fine. So like I mentioned, there are analog and digital outputs. And then you've also got Ethernet, Modbus, Profibus options in order to tie these into your system. And uh, this is our MCT 466 Quick Check. This is for benchtop or nearline moisture applications. A lot of uh, a lot of the companies, especially in some of these smaller biomass plants, will just have one of these in their lab, and it's great for just grabbing a sample from the process, and you throw it in a pan. Basically, the pan rotates, and it gives you a reading in about 10 seconds. 
Uh, there's no sample preparation. Like I said, you grab it and toss it in. And they can't hold multiple calibrations for different products. Uh, so a lot of these plants also, uh, especially some of the power plants that are burning hog fuel sometimes, uh, you may need a different calibration for the different types of wood you have. So if you've got hog fuel or if you're bringing in dust, um, some larger chips and smaller chips may not run under the same calibration. So you may find you'll have different calibrations for four different products. Uh, and I appreciate you guys for your time. Um, here's my contact information. If you need any more information, I, I do ask you to go uh, visit our website at www.processsensors.com. Right, great. Thank you, Rich, um, for that presentation. Uh, I do like the way that you didn't hit on um, the quality control, and that, that is a huge issue for these new industries, um, as well as um, for certain types of uh, uh, boilers for um, electricity plants as well. So we're going to move over to um, our Q&A, and I'm going to, Chris, if you're not um, unmuted, if you can unmute yourself so um, I can ask you a question, and also Brent as well. Um, I do have I'm one back. question. Okay. Chris, are you back on? Uh, I unmute you, so you're back on. So the, the first question I have, um, I guess it's more of a statement, and it's just kind of how things are run in the southeast. Um, of course, loggers and trucking contractors, you know, they're, they're paid by this weight. So, I mean, hauling less weight it means less revenue. So what, I guess, do you have any solutions for this? Or, um, you know, Scandinavia, do they charge so much per um, moisture and species? Or, I mean, how, do you, how would you address this and setting up this market? So the the trick is to reward folks not based on weight, but based on energy delivered. So if you have the um, if you have the weight of the truck, right, which they they get already because you go over a scale full and empty, um, and then you have the moisture content of the wood, there should be a reasonable um, price that you could reward loggers for bringing that dryer wood. We had discussions with Craven early on where um, they had a, they had a, they proposed to us a, a price schedule that they were going to pay loggers. Um, and it's, it's pretty important that you actually pay them reasonably. Otherwise there's no incentive to deliver dryer wood. So the, the truth, how to say it, the truth of of what the wood is, the, the of the worth of that wood to a manufacturer is pretty easily known, and there won't be a whole lot of opportunity for paying loggers less than it's actually worth to the operator. Um, and again, if they don't, the loggers aren't going to go through the extra effort of drying wood for six to six months to a year unless they're adequately rewarded for it. So the, the answer to your question is no, you won't be able to pay based solely on weight. It's going to have to be a combination of weight and moisture content if infield drying is going to be a success. Okay, so I guess maybe some, some policy or incentive could, could work in this case. Like I guess with the BCAP program, if they had some kind of incentive, maybe that could get markets going. Well, I think the, the, the incentive the the incentive for the for the people buying wood is that they end up with a, a much more valuable fuel, um, in in more valuable even than just the the lower heating value would indicate. If they are seeing a twenty five to thirty percent increase in the efficiency of their boilers, that that means that every BTU goes in that goes in has, you know, 25% more energy value for producing electricity, that's that's a very, very, very big deal for them. Um, and so the incentive really is, how to say it, for instance, if, um, if Rich's sensor went in and, you know, rough terms, you know, one of their sensors is somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000. I mean, you could make back your 
investment in sensing moisture by motivating higher higher BT fuels to show up, you know, in the first week. It, it wouldn't take a week to make the money back on on a sensor if you change your your policy, your you know your purchase price for wood energy. I mean, it's okay. it's really that it's really as simple as that. And but what it's going to require is a change in attitude and a change in the way we think about wood, from being you know it's a weight to it's an energy. I'm going to move on. We only have um, two more minutes left, so I'm trying to get some okay. more questions in. Um, one of them was, uh, how do you think uh, you're able to get the wood dried below equil equilibrium moisture content? And we won't, you know, and and none of the none of the drying that we did got below equilibrium moisture content. The a, a rough estimate of what equilibrium moisture content is in North Carolina is right around. Um, Nine percent, ten percent, depending on um, relative humidity and temperature. But I think that's a that's a reasonable estimate to make. Um, in no case did we ever get below equilibrium moisture content. We were always flirting with, you know, probably. I think the very best we ever did was about fifteen percent. So okay. there was still there was still room to dry. So another question to you. Um, so. Do you see any like seasonality effect? Um, I'm pretty sure it was in the graph, but maybe it was kind of hidden in the data. Um, I guess winter versus summer, spring versus fall, and also where th was the species that you're using? Was that loblolly pine? Um, the pine was all loblolly. The hardwoods were mixed, and yeah, there was absolutely a, a seasonal effect. But um, rather than call it simply a seasonal effect, it was you know you could think of it as a seasonal effect, but it was you know drier, warmer weather, um, dried wood out quicker. You know, that's I, that's that was the way I would, I think I would prefer to describe it. You know, so that if you, you could take this data and say, ah, you know, for some reason the Farmer's Almanac has told me that summer 2014 is gonna be particularly dry. You know, you could make a forecast about what your, what your wood's moisture content would be at the end of the, you know, if you cut it in March, you know, you could make guesses as to what it was going to be in June or July or August. Did humidity have any effect on that walking? Yep. Yeah, the uh, the humidity was probably the second most important, second most significant um, effect. Another question to you is, I noticed that you, um, your study all involved, um, I guess looking at biomass, uh, the butts out orientation piles, and also on trailers. Did you do any um, comparison with just kind of leaving uh, the biomass material out in the field? I mean, so far the the only thing we've, the only drying study we've done has been on the trailers. The the work that's going to be coming will be in the field, um, probably with that butts out orientation. Okay. Looks like we are um, running out of time here, so I'm going to okay. uh, close the Q&A. And I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, see, I will make sure um, that Chris Hopkins gets your question and he can um, email you back. If you want to um, provide me your email privately, I can, I can make sure he answers your question. Um, so thank you, everyone, for uh, your participation. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be provided on um, the forestry webinar portal page. Um, you know, some of your friends that, that may be interested in uh, hearing this webinar can um, attend and also receive their continuing education credits. If you guys lost that page, um, I'm going to send you the link where you can go to finish up um, the process to get your continuing education credit there if you um, closed out that browser for that second step. Um, Brent, can I, are you online? Yeah, I'm back. Okay. Well, I, I just want to thank um, I want to thank Brent. I want to thank our speakers, Chris Hawkins, Rich Harley. Um, you know, great job on uh, this this topic. Um, I, I feel like it's something that you know could happen in the near future. Um, looking at um, just the value of the material and energy, especially as you know, you know as climate change kind of comes into effect and um, you know, transportation costs and you know diesel increases and you know just a lot of um, a lot of things at play that could, I guess, encourage um, using um, 
are purchasing this uh, biomass based on energy rather than um, tonnage. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Brent, if you have any last comments. And thanks again, uh, everyone. I, I don't. I think, like I said, this is an interesting topic, and I think there's many ways to explore the combination between tonnage and moisture content, maybe create some kind of matrix um, and rewarding uh, a higher value fuel being delivered to the site. But I, again, I want to I express my appreciation to Chris and Rich today and um, looking forward to the uh, folks' participation today. Hope they'll join us for future webinars, and I, and I think you have some information on that, Walter. Yes, I do. Um, we have another webinar coming up March 20th. Um, this is also kind of dealing with the, I guess I'm calling it the Renewable Fuel Standard Part 3. Um, this time around, we're going to look at the yeah, fuel petition process and other requirements for um, you know, biofuels facilities that want to come online. Um, we actually have a speaker from the EPA, and we're going to be inviting someone from the private industry as well to um, kind of give their perspectives on you know, what it takes to get these stocks approved and, um, you know, get all the necessary permits um, to start producing biofuels that will count towards um, the RFS2 mandate. Stay tuned for that. Um, you can always go on the website link there as well to see other upcoming webinars, and we do have a couple left in the series, so stay tuned. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm going to go ahead and officially close this webinar now. Uh, but I'll be on the line if anybody has any further questions they would like to ask me. I'll stick, stick around for another five, ten minutes. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend.